Hello, and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver, and I'm a scientist, and back there is Cindy Oliver, and she's a dog. A dog with a little bit of a chewing problem. Back in 1998, Andrew Wakefield authored a fraudulent study that falsely claimed that the MMR vaccine caused autism. It took 12 years for the extent of the fraud to be uncovered and for the paper to be retracted and for Mr Wakefield to lose his licence to practice medicine. In the meantime, numerous studies were published showing there was no link between the vaccine and autism. But none of this has stopped anti-vaxxers preying on parents of children with autism and trying to make them feel guilty about something that wasn't their fault. Worse still are those ostracising people on the autism spectrum by failing to appreciate the rewarding lives many lead and the contributions they make to society. Of course, it's easy to understand how people can be vulnerable to assuming that something that happened after a vaccine was caused by a vaccine. We like to have answers, but sometimes there are no answers. A lot of conditions are idiopathic, which means there is no known cause. They just occur spontaneously. So how do we know if something has occurred spontaneously or if it is caused by a vaccine? Well, there are two ways. Firstly, companies are required to do clinical trials before vaccines are approved, and this will pick up any common adverse events that are caused by vaccines. Secondly, after a vaccine is approved, marketing surveillance is undertaken. So let's go back to the science and have a look at clinical trials. Before any vaccine or indeed any therapeutic good is approved for use in the general public, it must undergo a phase three clinical trial. And in a phase three clinical trial, the drug being tested is compared with a placebo and both the efficacy and adverse events are assessed. To confirm an adverse event is actually associated with the drug or vaccine being tested, the adverse event must occur more frequently in people taking the drug or vaccine. This study here, which was published in JAMA Network Open, is a systematic review and meta-analysis of 12 different studies that were completed for COVID vaccines. And what they did in this study was they specifically looked at adverse events that occurred in the placebo groups of each study compared with adverse events that occurred in the treatment group. This figure here summarises the findings of the review. The chart on the left shows adverse events after the first dose and the chart on the right shows adverse events after the second dose. The orange squares are for the vaccine group and the blue squares are for the placebo group. Now, the adverse events that we are talking about in this study are non-serious adverse events, things like headache and fatigue. Now, two things are apparent when you look at the data. The first is that adverse events are more likely to occur after the second dose than after the first dose in the vaccine group. The second is that there is still a significant number of adverse events that actually occur in the placebo group. And overall, around about 30% of participants experience an adverse event after receiving a placebo. This is typically referred to as a nocebo effect, and it is the opposite of a placebo effect. A placebo effect is when you falsely attribute a good outcome to a therapy when, in fact, it was just going to happen anyway. A nocebo effect is when you falsely attribute a bad outcome to a therapy. Now, it's important to note that a nocebo effect isn't necessarily something that people are imagining. It's just more the case the, that things like headache and fatigue are common occurrences. So it's not surprising that sometimes they will occur after getting a placebo because they occur all the time. And what this means is even if you get a common adverse event after a vaccine, it doesn't necessarily mean it was caused by the vaccine. It certainly could have been caused by the vaccine because 
particularly after the second dose, the incidence of systemic events is definitely higher in the vaccine group, but it could also just be a coincidence. And it's also worth mentioning that a similar systematic review was also published in the Lancet Regional Health Europe around the same time as the one we've just discussed. And they also had similar findings. So that's common adverse events. However, we know that some adverse events are so rare that they won't be picked up in clinical trials because they may only be occurring in one in 100,000 or less people. And therefore, the trials aren't large enough to pick them up. The way these adverse events are picked up is through post-marketing surveillance. And all countries have regulatory systems for picking up these adverse events. The most well-known one is probably VAERS in the USA, but there is also the yellow card scheme in the UK. And in Australia, where I live, it is done by the TGA, which stands for Therapeutic Goods Administration. Often the surveillance system will have both a passive and an active component. For instance, in the USA, VAERS is a passive surveillance system. Anyone can report an adverse event to VAERS, but they don't actually survey people. However, it's mandatory for healthcare professionals to report any serious adverse events to the system. And they have to report events even if they don't believe they are caused by the vaccine. Any serious event that occurs after taking a vaccine must be reported by healthcare professionals. In the US, there is also a system known as VSAFE, which is an active safety monitoring system for vaccines. People enrolling in the VSAFE system are sent text and web surveys that specifically ask about adverse events following the vaccine. And we had a similar system in Australia. And here are a few examples of some of the things that are reported to VAERS. The patient experienced dick was hard on an unspecified date. The outcome was unknown. Here's another one. On an unspecified date, the patient experienced penis is small. The action taken with COVID-19 vaccine was not applicable. The outcome of penis is small was not reported. Oh, there's this one. Approximately 12 hours after the second COVID shot, patient began experiencing random erections that came on every 30 minutes and lasted for five minutes each. Each erection got larger and harder as time went on. This went on for approximately eight hours. The symptom didn't subside until the patient was able to have sexual relations with his wife. One more. As of one week ago, penis has grown approximately three inches. Penile function remains intact. No other symptoms. Now, the interesting thing about this one is the person was also taking vitamin D and fish oil. So stay tuned for someone posting another video on the wonderful benefits of vitamin D. Now, I must say there seems to be quite a penis obsession with people reporting adverse events on theirs. It's really quite curious. Of course, not all reports to theirs are about penises. There are heaps of other equally crazy reports. And if you're interested in reading more of these reports, I'll provide a link to a Google document that covers them. Importantly, though, even though there are a lot of rather humorous reports of adverse events on VAERS, there are, of course, also serious adverse events reported. And all of these adverse events are investigated to determine if they are linked to the vaccine or if they are just occurring by coincidence. This is done both by looking at the medical records of the patient as well as comparing the incidence of the event to the baseline rate. And that is, of course, how we identified myocarditis and pericarditis as rare side effects following the mRNA vaccines and how thrombosis with thrombocytopenia was identified as a rare side effect following the adenovirus vector vaccines.
And these investigations are done both by regulatory authorities in the countries where the adverse events occur and also by independent scientists. Here is an example of one such study, which was published in the British Medical Journal. In this study, they specifically investigated whether there was an association with COVID-19 vaccination or SARS-CoV-2 infection and immune-mediated neurological events. And the events they were specifically looking at were Bell's palsy, which is a facial muscle weakness or paralysis, encephalomyelitis, which is inflammation of the brain and spinal cord, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a disorder where the body's immune system damages nerves, and transverse myelitis, which is a disorder caused by inflammation of the spinal cord. Now, you can imagine if any of these conditions occurred after getting a vaccination or after a COVID infection, the automatic assumption would be that the vaccination or infection caused the condition. But it is important to know that these conditions are known to occur in people without any identifiable cause. And therefore, to determine if they are actually associated with vaccination or infection, we need to analyse whether the incidence is any greater following vaccination or infection than the base rate in the general population. To answer this question, they looked at primary care records from the United Kingdom and primary care records from Spain linked to hospital data. And this figure summarises what they found. The chart on the left is a summary of the data from the UK, and the chart on the right is the summary of the data from Spain. For Bell's palsy, they looked at the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, and the J&J vaccine. And in all cases, there was no association between Bell's palsy and the vaccines. However, they did see an association with a positive COVID-19 test and subsequent Bell's palsy. Similarly, for encephalomyelitis, there was no association with the vaccines, but there was an association with a positive COVID result. And the same trend was continued for Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now, if you're wondering why not all the vaccines were included in the encephalomyelitis and Guillain-Barre syndrome analysis, it was because the number of events that occurred following the other vaccines were too low to do a proper statistical analysis. And for transverse myelitis, this was the case for all vaccines and also for infection because it's just very low incidence. Another important point to make is that Although they didn't find an association with Guillain-Barre syndrome and the AstraZeneca vaccine in this study, other studies have shown an association. So we can't definitively say that Guillain-Barre syndrome isn't a rare side effect following a denovirus vector vaccines. And you'll note that the error bar does cross the vertical line for the AstraZeneca vaccine. So the studies showing that there was an association aren't actually inconsistent with this study. Hopefully at some stage, someone will do a meta-analysis, which will give us a better answer to the question. Now, another thing which seems to be getting a lot of hand-wringing at the moment is athletes having cardiac arrests after suspected vaccinations. And I say suspected because in many cases, there is no evidence that the person involved was even vaccinated. I'll be making a separate video about this because there are a number of quite crazy claims being made. But one thing I will mention now is that sadly, athletes having cardiac arrests is not new. This paper here is one of many studies that has previously investigated cardiac arrests in younger athletes. In this paper, they were specifically looking at the FIFA Sudden Death Registry and they identified 617 patients from 2014 to 2018 who had either suffered from sudden cardiac death or sudden cardiac arrest. So unfortunately, these type of incidents are quite common and they were obviously occurring well before we started vaccinating for COVID.
So in summary, we know that adverse events can occur following vaccination. A lot of these are minor and they aren't always actually caused by the vaccine. Sometimes they can just be a coincidence. There are also some rare but serious adverse events that can occur following vaccine, but not every event that happens after vaccination is actually caused by the vaccine. Sometimes it is also an unlucky coincidence. However, that's not to take away from the serious adverse events that we know can rarely occur. If you'd like to look further into the data that I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the video, please, please press the like button so that YouTube will show it to more people. And if you'd like to see more videos about the science in the future, please hit the subscribe button.